Hey guys, Captain Foley and Samuel Cockings are back for another Trek Yards announcement. Hello guys. Oh, another one. Come on, Stuart. Come on. <laughs> what can I say? We're good. <laughs> anyway, um, today's special guest is also an iconic Star Trek designer, and uh, I'm very happy to announce Mr. John Eves, everybody. Hello. Hello, John. How are you? Welcome to the show. Thank you. All right. So. One of the first questions I'm going to ask is, how did you get started in Star Trek? What brought you to the Star Trek universe, so to speak? Oh, it was uh, actually very lucky timing. I uh, was uh, uh, working for Greg Jean in the model shop. We were doing a bunch of models, so I got on the TNG a little bit, did a bunch of uh, models with him. And then uh, a friend of mine wanted to hook me up with Herman, Herman Zimmerman, the designer on DS9. And um, they had already filled up their, their crew, but uh, he asked if I could make some Star Trek models for him. So I got some model kits, I made them, and I drew a picture of how the stand and the bases went. He goes, oh, I like these models, and I see you can draw too. Uh, <laughs> perhaps uh, if I need an illustrator, I'll call you. And we went our separate ways, and he called me when uh, Generation started up. So so I kind of got in that. Uh, that. That was the art department entrance anyways. But working with Greg Jean, I uh, got to work in the model shop on Star Trek V and, of course, a lot of the TNG models. So so uh, I got to work in kind of both worlds, uh, especially the model world was a lot of fun. Of course, they do it all on the computer now, but it was yeah. great, great fun to get in those model days. So as I'm sure the fans would know, you worked on two Enterprises, the Enterprise B, or Excelsior Class Refit, and Enterprise E, Sovereign Class. What was it like to be part of and design this iconic design lineage? Oh, it was very uh, funny because uh, the Enterprise B was actually the, f the first project I had in the art department. And uh, my boss goes, well, we can't afford a new starship. Uh, that was, that was uh, really tight budget days back then when they did it. And uh, the, what benefited doing uh, Star Trek movies is they could use the, uh, the Star Trek sets from the TV shows. Mm -hmm. And it was the same with the models. That's why you'll see models crisscross over from movies to TV shows if they just change the names. But um, with the B... Uh, or the uh, Excelsior, that was the, the choice of the, the production crew. They go, let's take the Excelsior and we'll turn that into the B. And then according to the script, we had this uh, this uh, kind of energy ribbon that was going to whack out a part of the ship. So we kind of drew all kinds of little kind of tidbits of the ship where the energy would hit, and it just didn't work too well. So we came up with that kind of PBY uh, flying boat bottom, mm -hmm. which made a really nice kind of extension out. It changed the whole profile of the ship, so it made it look like a different vessel, okay. and uh, it made a nice point for that whole entire sequence where the uh, the bolt had to wipe out the uh, the, the little kind of coordinating room by the deflector dish, and then um, adding the little engines up on top was kind of the basis of where the Enterprise E got its impulse engines on the saucer. So it was kind of a predecessor to what the E was going to be, just by these little extra details. But oh, the cool. Excelsior was always a favorite ship, so it was. Uh, a great honor to add some new stuff to that. And Bill George's design on that was just remarkable. Always one of my favorites. Yeah. Um, so I know this is kind of a loaded question, <laughs> but we've asked the other designers too. Out of all the stuff you've designed over the years, what do you think was one of your favorites and why? I know it's like kind of picking your favorite kid, but, you know, we got to <laughs> ask. <laughs> well, I, I actually do have a favorite. It was uh, in First Contact, and we have this little Vulcan ship that comes out of the clouds. And uh, the, the reason it's, it's such a special one to me is I was always an enormous Jerry Goldsmith fan. And as a kid, uh, I'd watch his great movies. And, and you, he always not only writes themes for his characters, but he does his, uh, his elements as well, spaceship or airplanes or whatever he's doing. They usually have a little theme. And I remember watching uh, the motion picture, and I thought, wow, he wrote a, a theme for the, for the Enterprise. And then he wrote a special theme for the uh, the Vulcan ship that comes in and does the, the aerial dock. And V'ger had its own theme. And I remember thinking at theater, boy, wouldn't it be cool to make something and have Mr. Goldsmith write a piece of music to it? And and uh, I remember when that Vulcan ship came out and the Goldsmith score on top of it. It was just magic. And I actually I snuck in and watched him record that particular moment. So I got to see it from both ends, the, from the recording studio all the way to the, the final film. And that's that probably my most favorite highlight of the whole Star Trek. Wow. So people might know, hopefully, that obviously you worked on the TNG movies and also on Enterprise, which is fair to say the opposite ends of the spectrum. We worked on the latest prime timeline and also the earliest, 24th and 22nd. So what was it like working on such different ends of the, of the timeline and maybe the complete opposites in terms of technology? What was it that 
difference like? Well, it was it was always a kind of a, a laugh in the in the art <laughs> department because we were drawing in the future, but in the future's past. So it was always a kind of a conflicting element because uh, you know the T and G kind of set the the this far forward standard while Enterprise was going to set. Uh, the farthest uh, back in time, so we had that entire circular world of time to to fill, and um, of course it would have been fun to have been able to do more '60s style designs mm -hmm. to fit with the original series. But uh, just in the day and age, that type of design work just just didn't fly as as something that would be plausible for a, a modern TV show. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would have loved to seen the original Enterprise. Or that a variant of that fly again, and Doug Drexler tried to do the the same thing when we we're doing the NX01, and just the world we live in now with the with the technology and what audiences want, it, it had to go a little bit, a little bit more future look, but trying to keep it retro at the same time, and uh, that was one of the big challenges of the show was redoing a lot of favorite ships, but in kind of a retro style, and uh, the Klingons were especially fun because we we're trying to think what will we do with Klingon ships, and uh, I remember seeing the, these old Soviet footages of like the inside of the Soyuz and their rockets and there's cables all over the place and they're stepping over stuff and I thought maybe the Klingon world would be like that with their ships so there's like these little guide wires all over the ships kind of holding them together like tension rods and tension wire and that kind of defined the Klingon look and so it, uh, each little ship had its own kind of variation on that kind of stuff but with all the new ships we got to do uh, we'd wait for Mike Akuta to design the logo for the for the race and would base the ship on that. So it was an oval, would do oval ships. It was a sharp, jaggedy logo he'd come up with, kind of base it on what he came up with as far as the uh, the logo or the insignia for the race was going to be. So he was kind of the, uh, he would tell us basically where we were going to go, and I don't think he ever even knew it. So, Well, that kind of addresses my next question, because I was going to ask, as a designer, when you get a uh, ship that you need to design, I was going to, what is your thinking? What is your uh, initial process to come up with a design like what 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 inspires you i guess uh um usually the the, the script will tell you where you're going to go because they're pretty good uh, descriptions not enough to tell you exactly what to do but enough where you can kind of figure it out and as long as you know what what it's going to do if it has an action you know it's going to have to have some part of movable parts or it's going to have to have uh guns that will fire to the back so it, you know, it's all kind of script oriented what what they go into but as far as reference goes imagination just comes from everything and, and I think working in the model shop was the biggest help with that because mm -hmm. we walk through say uh, Pier 1 Imports and there's that was the Star Trek uh, kind of store for all the uh, the set dressing yeah and you'd walk through there and you see like these weird things you go wow that'd make a cool exhaust pipe for for this or uh, or the same thing walking through the grocery store. You look at things from a different point of view, and that all came from the model shop when we were kit bashing stuff. Because you're always looking for that little, that little extra, and that kind of translated over the ship. So I have to say, champagne bottles and and uh, shampoo bottles really <laughs> inspired a lot of spaceships. I have to say. So yeah. <laughs> it's cool. nice that Star Trek's almost taking its own inspiration from itself, but different departments. That's kind of a nice little yeah scenes. But mm -hmm. also you've worked on Modern Trek as well, the 2009-2013 JJ films. Do you want to tell us how you got involved in the current iteration of Trek and maybe sort of little bits of what you've done uh, with those films? Oh, it was, it was interesting because they, they had a rule on uh, the first uh, JJ's film that no one from the prior Star Trek films were allowed to be on the new one. They wanted to keep it completely brand new and go in a new direction. Yeah. And I had interviewed with the uh, production designer, Scott Chambliss, on uh, one of the Mission Impossible movies. And I guess they they had let somebody go. And I, I interviewed for it. He goes, I'm sorry, I can't bring you on because of this this Paramount CBS rule. But he, uh, I guess he lost somebody and he, and he asked me to come in. He goes, I'm going to give you a 30-day trial. And um, he goes, if long as you can draw what I ask you and you're not inspired by the older shows, we'll go for it. And I go, well, that's the job. So whatever you tell me to do, I'll do it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I learned out quickly you don't open your mouth <laughs> about anything with an opinion, especially then because it was dangerous ground to, to bring that up. Oh, if I would say, oh, in the old show, we, I never did that. But it was, it was very funny to watch them go out and buy the same stuff we used on our shows on the sets 
uh, a lot of uh, like septic tank pipes and stuff. They came in with all this stuff. They go, look at this cool stuff we found. And I'm going, that's Klingon. <laughs> <laughs> interesting. And, and so they, they actually found all the same stuff that we had already used. But it was funny to see someone think they had found it for the first time. So yeah, it was it was great fun. And uh, they uh, they put me on the shuttles uh, the first thing. So I did a lot of shuttles and a little flying motorcycle and then drifted over to the props. And I met them. The uh, the uh, prop designer there, his name's Russell Bobbitt, and it, it started a real good relationship. And I think I've done probably eight or nine movies with him now. So, huh. so uh, always always good. And then the later Into Darkness was all props on that one, and worked with Chris Ross and uh, Andy Andy Siegel, and uh, it was good times. Always good times. Wow. It, what's really fun is a lot of of model makers that I work with at Boss Film and Apogee have gotten into the computer world, like Scott Schneider and uh, a bunch of these guys. And they, it's fun to work again with them after like 20 years, but in a whole different realm. So uh, they're all doing this fabulous computer work. And mm -hmm. Very fun. They yeah, still draw with a pencil, so I'm happy. <laughs> I can't wait for 20 years down the road when we do Trek Yards Phase 2, me and Samuel. <laughs> <laughs> and then the motion picture, and the Wrath of Stuart, and then the search for... Just keep mm -hmm. going, yeah. Oh, man. Anyway... Well, there you have it, guys. That's our newest uh, guest announcement. Hope you guys are excited, as excited as we are. Um, as always, check out TrekYards.com for all of our past episodes and other, uh, other guest announcements. Uh, follow us on Facebook and Twitter, and keep tuning in because we have a lot of great stuff. Always click subscribe and like because that really helps us out, and it helps you out because you get all the regular updates. Anyway, this is Captain Foley, our special guest, John Eves, and Samuel Cockins. As always. <laughs> signing off until next time. Bye, guys. Thanks for having me. See you guys.